What It Means to Become a Person by Carl Rogers This chapter was first given as a talk to a meeting at Oberlin College in 1954. I was trying to pull together in more completely organized form some of the conceptions of therapy which had been growing in me. I have revised it slightly. As is customary with me, I was trying to keep my thinking close to the grassroots of actual experience in therapeutic interviews. So, I drew heavily upon recorded interviews as the source of the generalizations which I make. In my work at the Counseling Center of the University of Chicago, I have the opportunity of working with people who present a wide variety of personal problems. There is the student concerned about failing in college, the housewife disturbed about her marriage, the individual who feels he is teetering on the edge of a complete breakdown or psychosis, the responsible professional man who spends much of his time in sexual fantasies and functions inefficiently in his work. The brilliant student at the top of his class who was paralyzed by the conviction that he is hopelessly and helplessly inadequate. The parent who is distressed by his child's behavior. The popular girl who finds herself unaccountably overtaken by sharp spells of black depression. The woman who fears that life and love are passing her by and that her good graduate record is a poor recompense. The man who has become convinced that powerful or sinister forces are plotting against him. I could go on and on with the many different and unique problems which people bring to us. They run the gamut of life's experiences. Yet there is no satisfaction in giving this type of catalog, for, as counselor, I know that the problem as stated in the first interview will not be the problem as seen in the second or third R, and by the tenth interview it will be a still different problem or series of problems. I have, however, come to believe that in spite of this bewildering horizontal multiplicity and the layer upon layer of vertical complexity, there is perhaps only one problem. As I follow the experience of many clients in a therapeutic relationship which we endeavor to create for them, it seems to me that each one is raising the same question. Below the level of the problem situation about which the individual is complaining, behind the trouble with studies, or wife, or employer, or with his own uncontrollable or bizarre behavior, or with his frightening feelings, lies one central search. It seems to me that at bottom, each person is asking, Who am I, really? How can I get in touch with this real self, underlying all my surface behavior? How can I become myself? The process of becoming, getting behind the mask. Let me try to explain what I mean when I say that it appears a goal the individual most wishes to achieve, the end which he knowingly and unknowingly pursues, is to become himself. When a person comes to me, troubled by his unique combination of difficulties, I have found it most worthwhile to try to create a relationship with him in which he is safe and free. It is my purpose to understand the way he feels in his own inner world, to accept him as he is, to create an atmosphere of freedom in which he can move in his thinking and feeling and being, in any direction he desires. How does he use this freedom? It is my experience that he uses it to become more and more himself. He begins to drop the false fronts or the masks or the roles with which he has faced life. He appears to be trying to discover something more basic, something more truly himself. At first, he lays aside masks which he is to some degree aware of using. One young woman student describes in a counseling interview one of the masks she has been using and how uncertain she is whether, underneath this appeasing, ingratiating front, there is any real self with convictions. I was thinking about this business of standards. I somehow develop a sort of knack, I guess, of well, habit of trying to make people feel at ease around me or to make things go along smoothly. There always had to be some appeaser around being sort of the oil that soothed the waters. At a small meeting or, or a little party or something, I could help things go along nicely and appear to be having a good time. 
and sometimes I'd surprise myself by arguing against what I really thought when I saw that the person in charge would be quite unhappy about it if I didn't. In other words, I just wasn't ever, I mean, I didn't find myself ever being set and definite about things. Now the reason why I did it probably was I had been doing it around home so much. I just didn't stand up for my own convictions until I don't know whether I have any convictions to stand up for. I haven't been really honestly being myself or actually knowing what my real self is. And I have just been playing a sort of false role. You can, in this excerpt, see her examining the mask she has been using, recognizing her dissatisfaction with it and wondering how to get to the real self underneath, if such a self exists. In this attempt to discover his own self, the client typically uses the relationship to explore, to examine the various aspects of his own experience, to recognize and phase up to the deep contradictions which he often discovers. He learns how much of his behavior, even how much of the feeling he experiences is not real, is not something which flows from the genuine reactions of his organism, but is a facade, a front behind which he has been hiding. He discovers how much of his life is guided by what he thinks he should be, not by what he is. Often he discovers that he exists only in response to the demands of others, that he seems to have no self of his own, that he is only trying to think and feel and behave in the way that others believe he ought to think and feel and behave. In this connection, I have been astonished to find how accurately the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard pictured the dilemma of the individual more than a century ago with keen psychological insight. He points out that the most common despair is to be in despair at not choosing or willing to be oneself, but that the deepest form of despair is to choose to be another than himself. On the other hand, To will to be that self which one truly is, is indeed the opposite of despair. And this choice is the deepest responsibility of man. As I read some of his writing, I almost feel that he must have listened in on the statements made by our clients as they search and explore for the reality of self, often a painful and troubling search. This exploration becomes even more disturbing when they find themselves involved in removing the false faces which they had not known were false faces. They begin to engage in the frightening task of exploring the turbulent and sometimes violent feelings within themselves. To remove a mask which you had thought was part of your real self can be a deeply disturbing experience. Yet when there is freedom to think and feel and be, the individual moves towards such a goal. A few statements from a person who had completed a series of psychotherapeutic interviews will illustrate this. She uses many metaphors as she tells how she struggled to get to the core of herself. As I look at it now, I was peeling off layer after layer of defenses. I'd build them up try them and then discard them when you remain the same. I didn't know what was at the bottom and I was very much afraid to find out. But I had to keep on trying. At first, I felt there was nothing within me, just a great emptiness where I needed and wanted a solid core. Then I began to feel that I was facing a solid brick wall, too high to get over and too thick to go through. One day, the wall became translucent rather than solid. After this, the wall seemed to disappear, but beyond it, I discovered a dam holding back violent churning waters. I felt as if I were holding back the force of these waters, and if I opened even a tiny hole, I and all about me would be destroyed in the ensuing torrent of feelings represented by the water. Finally, I could stand the strain no longer and I let go. All I did actually was to succumb to complete and utter self-pity, then hate, then love. 
After this experience, I felt as if I had leaped the brink and was safely on the other side, though still tottering a bit on the edge. I, I don't know what I was searching for or where I was going, but I felt then, as I've always felt whenever I really lived, that I was moving forward. I believe this represents rather well the feelings of many an individual, that if the false front, the wall, the damp is not maintained, then everything will be swept away in the violence of the feelings that he discovers pent up in his private world. Yet it also illustrates the compelling necessity which the individual feels to search for and become himself. It also begins to indicate the way in which the individual determines the reality in himself, that when he fully experiences the feelings, which at an organic level he is, as this client experiences her self-pity, hatred, and love, then he feels an assurance that he is being a part of his real self. The Experience of Feeling I would like to say something more about this experiencing of feeling. It is really the discovery of unknown elements of self. The phenomenon I am trying to describe is something which I think is quite difficult to get across in any meaningful way. In our daily lives, there are a thousand and one reasons for not letting ourselves experience our attitudes fully. Reasons from our past and from the present. Reasons that reside within the social situation. It seems too dangerous, too potentially damaging to experience them freely and fully. But in the safety and freedom of the therapeutic relationship, they can be experienced fully clear to the limit of what they are. They can be and are experienced in a fashion that I like to think as a pure culture. So that for the moment, the person is his fear or he is his anger or he is his tenderness or whatever. Perhaps again, I can clarify this by giving an example from a client which will indicate and convey something of what I mean. A young man, a graduate student who is deep in therapy, has been puzzling over a vague feeling which he senses in himself. He gradually identifies it as a frightened feeling of some kind of fear of failing, a fear of not getting his PhD. Then comes a long pause. From this point on, we will let the recorded interview speak for itself. I was kind of letting it seep through but I also tied it in with you and with my relationship with you. And that's one thing I feel about it is kind of a fear of it going away. Or that's another thing. It's so hard to get hold of. There's kind of two pulling feelings about it or two me somehow. One is the scared one that wants to hold on to things. And that one, I guess I can feel pretty clearly right now you know i kind of need things to hold on to and i feel kind of scared mm -hmm. and that's something you can feel right this minute and have been feeling and perhaps are feeling in regard to our relationship too won't you let me have this because you know i kind of need it i can be so lonely and scared without it hmm Hmm. Let me hang on to this because I'd be terribly scared if I didn't. Let me hold on to it. It's kind of the same thing. Won't you let me have my thesis or my PhD so then, because I kind of need that little world, I mean. In both instances, it's kind of a pleading thing too, isn't it? Let me have this because I need it badly. I'd be awfully frightened without it. I get a sense of, I, I, I can't somehow get much further. It's this kind of pleading little boy somehow, even. What's this gesture of begging? Isn't it funny? Because that... You put your hands in a sort of uh, supplication. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Won't you do this for me, kind of? Oh, that's terrible. Who, me? beg 
Perhaps this excerpt will convey a bit of the thing I have been talking about, the experiencing of a feeling all the way to the limit. Here he is for a moment, experiencing himself as nothing but a pleading little boy, supplicating, begging, dependent. At that moment, he is nothing but his pleadingness all the way through. To be sure, he almost immediately backs away from this experiencing by saying, Who? Me? Beg? But it has left its mark. As he says a moment later, It's such a wondrous thing to have these new things come out of me. It amazes me so much each time. And then again, there's that same feeling. Kind of feeling scared that I have so much of this that I'm keeping back or something. He realizes that this has bubbled through and that for that moment he is his dependency in a way which astonishes him. It is not only dependency that is experienced in this all-out kind of fashion. It may be hurt or sorrow or jealousy or destructive anger or deep desire or confidence and pride or sensitive tenderness or outgoing love. It may be any of the emotions of which man is capable. What I have gradually learned from experiences such as this is that the individual in such a moment is coming to be what he is. When a person has, throughout therapy, experienced in this fashion all the emotions which organismically arise in him and has experienced them in this knowing and open manner, then he has experienced himself in all the richness that exists within himself. He has become what he is. The discovery of self in experience. Let us pursue a bit further this question of what it means to become one's self. It is a most perplexing question. And again, I will try to take from a statement by a client written between interviews a suggestion of an answer. She tells how the various facades by which she has been living have somehow crumbled and collapsed, bringing a feeling of confusion but also a feeling of relief. She continues, You know, it seems as if all the energy that went into holding the arbitrary pattern together was quite unnecessary, a waste. You think you have to make the pattern yourself, but there are so many pieces and it's so hard to see where they fit. Sometimes you put them in the wrong place and the more pieces misfitted, the more effort it takes to hold them in place. Until at last you are so tired that even that awful confusion is better than holding on any longer. Then you discover that left to themselves, the jumbled pieces fall quite naturally into their own places and the living pattern emerges without any effort at all on your part your job is just to discover it and in the course of that you will find yourself in your own place you must even let your own experience tell you its own meaning the minute you tell it what it means you are at war with yourself Let me see if I can take her poetic expression and translate it into the meaning it has for me. I believe she is saying that to be herself means to find a pattern, the underlying order which exists in the ceaselessly changing flow of her experience. Rather than to try to hold her experience into the form of a mask or to make it be a form or structure that it is not, being herself means to discover the unity and harmony which exists in her own actual feelings and reactions. It means that the real self is something which is comfortably discovered in one's experiences, not something imposed upon it. Through giving excerpts from the statements of these clients, I have been trying to suggest what happens in the warmth and understanding of a facilitating relationship with a therapist. It seems that gradually, painfully, The individual explores what is behind the masks he presents to the world, and even behind the masks with which he has been deceiving himself. Deeply and often vividly, he experiences the various elements of himself which have been hidden within. Thus, to an increasing degree, he becomes himself, not a facade of conformity to others, 
not a cynical denial of all feeling, nor a front of intellectual rationality, but a living, breathing, feeling, fluctuating process. In short, he becomes a person. The person who emerges. I imagine that some of you are asking, but what kind of a person does he become? It isn't enough to say that he drops the facades. What kind of person lies underneath? Since one of the most obvious facts is that each individual tends to become a separate and distinct and unique person, the answer is not easy. However, I would like to point out some of the characteristic trends which I see. No one person would fully exemplify these characteristics. No one person fully achieves the description I will give. But I do see certain generalizations which can be drawn based upon living a therapeutic relationship with many clients. Openness to experience. First of all, I would say that in this process, the individual becomes more open to his experience. This is a phrase which has come to have a great deal of meaning to me. It is the opposite of defensiveness. Psychological research has shown that if the evidence of our senses runs contrary to our picture of self, then that evidence is distorted. In other words, we cannot see all that our senses report but only the things which fit the picture we have. Now, in a safe relationship of the sort I have described, this defensiveness or rigidity tends to be replaced by an increasing openness to experience. The individual becomes more openly aware of his own feelings and attitudes as they exist in him at an organic level, in the way I tried to describe. He also becomes more aware of reality as it exists outside of himself, instead of perceiving it in a preconceived categories. He sees that not all trees are green, not all men are stern fathers, not all women are rejecting, not all failure experiences prove that he is no good, and the like. He is able to take in the evidence in a new situation, as it is rather than distorting it to fit the pattern which he already holds. As you might expect, this increasing ability to be open to experience makes him far more realistic in dealing with new people, new situations, new problems. It means that his beliefs are not rigid, that he can tolerate ambiguity. He can receive much conflicting evidence without forcing closure upon the situation. This openness of awareness to what exists at this moment in oneself and in the situation is, I believe, an important element in the description of the person who emerges from therapy. Perhaps I can give this concept a more vivid meaning if I illustrate it from a recorded interview. A young professional man reports in the 48th interview the way in which he has become more open to some of his bodily sensations as well as other feelings. It doesn't seem to me that it would be possible for anyone to relate all the changes that you feel, but I certainly have felt recently that I have more respect for, more objectivity toward my physical makeup. I mean, I don't expect too much of myself. This is how it works out. It feels to me that in the past I used to fight a certain tiredness that I felt after supper. Well, now I feel pretty sure that I really am tired, that I am not making myself tired that I am just physiologically lower. It seems that I was just constantly criticizing my tiredness. So you let yourself be tired instead of feeling along with it, a kind of criticism of it. Yes, that I shouldn't be tired or something. And it seems in a way to be pretty profound that I can just not fight this tiredness. And along with it goes a real feeling of I've got to slow down too, so that being tired isn't such an awful thing. I think I can also kind of pick up a thread here of why I should be that way in the way my father is, in the way he looks at some of these things. For instance, say that I was sick and I would report this. And it would seem that overtly he would want to do something about it, but he would also communicate, Oh my gosh, more trouble. You know, something like that. 
as though there were something quite annoying really about being physically ill. Yeah, I'm sure that my father has the same disrespect for his own physiology that I have had. Now, last summer, I twisted my back. I wrenched it. I heard it snap and everything. There was real pain there all the time at first, real sharp. And I had a doctor look at it and he said it wasn't serious. It should heal by itself as long as I didn't bend too much. Well, this was months ago and I've been noticing recently that hell, this is a real pain and it's still there and it's not my fault. It doesn't prove something bad about you, no. And one of the reasons I seem to get more tired that I should maybe is because of this constant strain and so I've already made an appointment with one of the doctors at the hospital that he would look at it and take an x-ray or something. In a way, I guess you could say that I am just more accurately sensitive or objectively sensitive to this kind of thing. And this is really a profound change, as I say. And of course, my relationship with my wife and the two children is, well, you just wouldn't recognize it if you could see me inside as you have. I mean, um, there just doesn't seem to be anything more wonderful than really and genuinely really feeling love for your own children and at the same time receiving it. I don't know how to put this. We have such an increased respect, both of us, for, for Judy. And we've noticed, just as we participated in this, we have noticed such a tremendous change in her. It seems to be a pretty deep kind of thing. It seems to me you're saying that you can listen more accurately to yourself. If your body says it's tired, you listen to it and believe it instead of criticizing it. If it's in pain, you can listen to that. If the feeling is really loving your wife or children, you can feel that. And it seems to show up in the differences in them too. Here in a relatively minor but symbolically important excerpt, can be seen much of what I have been trying to say about openness to experience. Formerly, he could not freely feel pain or illness because being ill meant being unacceptable. Neither could he feel tenderness and love for his child because such feelings meant being weak and he had to maintain his facade of being strong. But now he can be genuinely open to the experiences of his organism. He can be tired when he is tired. He can feel pain when his organism is in pain. He can feel the experience the love he feels for his daughter. And he can also feel and express annoyance toward her, as he goes on to say in the next portion of his interview. He can fully live the experiences of his total organism, rather than shutting them out of his awareness. Trust in one's organism a second characteristic of the persons who emerge from therapy is difficult to describe. It seems that a person increasingly discovers that his own organism is trustworthy, that it is a suitable instrument for discovering the most satisfying behavior in each immediate situation. If this seems strange, let me try to state more fully. Perhaps it will help to understand my description if you think of the individual as faced with some existential choice. Shall I go home to my family during vacation or strike out on my own? Shall I drink this third cocktail which is being offered? Is this the person whom I would like to have as my partner in love and in life? Thinking of such situations, what seems to be true of the person who emerges from the therapeutic process? To the extent that this person is open to all of his experience, he has access to all of the available data in the situation on which to base his behavior. He has knowledge of his own feelings and impulses, which are often complex and contradictory. He is freely able to sense the social demands, from the relatively rigid social laws to the desires of friends and family. He has access to his memories of similar situations and the consequences of different behaviors in those situations. He has a relatively accurate perception of this external situation and all of its complexity. He is better able to permit his total organism, his conscious thought participating, to consider, weigh, and balance each stimulus, need, and demand in its relative weight and intensity. 
Out of this complex weighing and balancing, he is able to discover that course of action which seems to be closest to satisfying all his needs in a situation, long-range as well as immediate needs. In such a weighing and balancing of all the components of a given life choice, his organism would not by any means be infallible. Mistaken choices might be made, but because he tends to be open to his experience, there is a greater and more immediate awareness of unsatisfying consequences, a quicker correction of choices which are in error. It may help to realize that in most of us, the defects which interfere with this weighing and balancing are that we include things that are not a part of our experience and exclude elements which are. Thus, an individual may persist in the concept that, I can handle liquor, when openness to his past experience would indicate that this is scarcely correct. Or a young woman may see only the good qualities of her prospective mate where an openness to experience would indicate that he possesses faults as well. In general, then, it appears to be true that when a client is open to his experience, he comes to find his organism more trustworthy. He feels less fear of the emotional reactions which he has. There is a gradual growth of trust in and even affection for the complex, rich, varied assortment of feelings and tendencies which exist in him at the organic level. Consciousness, instead of being the watchman over a dangerous and unpredictable lot of impulses, of which few can be permitted to see the light of day, becomes the comfortable inhabitant of a society of impulses and feelings and thoughts which are discovered to be very satisfactorily self-governing when not fearfully guarded. An internal locus of evaluation. Another trend which is evident in this process of becoming a person relates to the source or locus of choices and decisions or evaluative judgments. The individual increasingly comes to feel that this locus of evaluation lies within himself. Less and less does he look to others for approval or disapproval, for standards to live by, for decisions and choices. He recognizes that it rests within himself to choose, that the only question which matters is, am I living in a way which is deeply satisfying to me and which truly expresses me? This, I think, is perhaps the most important question for the creative individual. Perhaps it will help if I give an illustration. I would like to give a brief portion of a recorded interview with a young woman, a graduate student, who had come for counseling help. She was initially very much disturbed about many problems and had been contemplating suicide. During the interview, one of the feelings she discovered was her great desire to be dependent, just to let someone else take over the direction of her life. She was very critical of those who had not given her enough guidance. She talked about one after another of her professors, feeling bitterly that none of them had taught her anything with deep meaning. Gradually, she began to realize that part of the difficulty was the fact that she had taken no initiative in participating in these classes. Then comes the portion I wish to quote. I think you will find that this excerpt gives you some indication of what it means in experience to accept the locus of evaluation as being within oneself. Here then is the quotation from one of the later interviews with this young woman as she has begun to realize that perhaps she is partly responsible for the deficiencies in her own education. Well, now, I wonder if I've been going around doing that, getting smatterings of things and not getting hold, not really getting down to things. Maybe you've been getting just spoonfuls here and there rather than really digging in somewhere rather deeply. Mm Mm-hmm, that's what I say. Well, with that sort of foundation, well, it's really up to me. I mean, it seems to be really apparent to me that I can't depend on someone else to give me an education. I'll really have to get it myself. It really begins to come home. There's only one person that can educate you. A realization that perhaps nobody else can give you an education. Hmm. I 
have all the symptoms of fright. Fright? That this is a scary thing? Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Do you want to say any more about what you mean by that? That it really does give you the symptoms of fright? <laughs> I don't know whether I quite know. I mean, well, it, it really seems like I'm cut loose. And it seems that I'm very, I don't know, in a vulnerable position. But I, uh, I brought this up and it, uh, somehow it almost came out without my saying it. It seems to be. It's something I let out. Hardly a part of you. Well, I felt surprised. As though, well, for goodness sake, did I say that? <laughs> really, I don't think I've had that feeling before. I've, uh, well, this really feels like I'm saying something that, uh, uh, is a part of me, really. Or, uh, hmm. It feels like I sort of have, uh, I don't know. I have a feeling of strength. And yet, I have a feeling of realizing it's so sort of fearful of, of fright. That is, do you mean that saying something of that sort gives you at the same time a feeling of of strength in saying it, and yet at the same time a frightened feeling of what you have said? Is that it? Mm, I am feeling that. For instance, I'm feeling it internally now, a sort of surging up or force or outlet. As if that's something really big and strong. And yet, uh, well, at first, it was almost a physical feeling of just being out alone. And sort of cut off from a support I had been carrying around. You feel that it's something deep and strong and surging forth. And at the same time... You just feel as though you'd cut yourself loose from any support when you say it. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's... I don't know. It's a disturbance of a kind of pattern I've been carrying around. I think. It sort of shakes a rather significant pattern. Jars it loose. Hmm... I, I think, I don't know, but I have the feeling that then I am going to begin to do more things that I, I know I should do. There are so many things that I need to do. It seems in so many avenues of my living, I have to work out new ways of behavior. But maybe I can see myself doing a little better in some things. I hope that this illustration gives some sense of the strength which is experienced in being a unique person, responsible for oneself, and also the uneasiness that accompanies this assumption of responsibility, to recognize that I am the one who chooses and I am the one who determines the value of an experience for me, is both an invigorating and a frightening realization. Willingness to be a process. I should like to point out one final characteristic of these individuals as they strive to discover and become themselves. It is that the individual seems to be more content to be a process rather than a product. When he enters the therapeutic relationship, the client is likely to wish to achieve some fixed state. He wants to reach the point where his problems are solved or where he is effective in his work or where his marriage is satisfactory. He tends in the freedom of the therapeutic relationship to drop such fixed goals and to accept a more satisfying realization that he is not a fixed entity, but a process of becoming. One client at the conclusion of therapy says in a rather puzzled fashion, 
I haven't finished the job of integrating and reorganizing myself. But that's only confusing, not discouraging, now that I realize this is a continuing process. It's exciting, sometimes upsetting, but deeply encouraging to feel yourself in action. Apparently knowing where you are going even though you don't always consciously know where that is. One can see here both the expression of trust in the organism, which I have mentioned, and also the realization of self as a process. Here is a personal description of what it seems like to accept oneself as a stream of becoming, not a finished product. It means that a person is a fluid process, not a fixed and static entity, a flowing river of change, not a block of solid material, a continually changing constellation of potentialities, not a fixed quantity of traits. Here is another statement of this same element of fluidity or existential living. This whole train of experiencing and the meanings that I have thus far discovered in it seem to have launched me on a process which is both fascinating and at times a little frightening. It seems to mean letting my experience carry me on in a direction which appears to be forward towards goals that I can but dimly define as I try to understand at least the current meaning of that experience. The sensation is that of floating, with a complex stream of experience, with the fascinating possibility of trying to comprehend its ever-changing complexity. Conclusion I have tried to tell you what has seemed to occur in the lives of people with whom I have had the privilege of being in a relationship as they struggle toward becoming themselves. I have endeavored to describe as accurately as I can the meanings which seem to be involved in this process of becoming a person. I am sure that this process is not one that occurs only in therapy. I am sure that I do not see it clearly or completely since I keep changing my comprehension and understanding of it. I hope you will accept it as a current and tentative picture, not as something final. One reason for stressing the tentative nature of what I have said is that I wish to make it clear that I am not saying, this is what you should become, here is the goal for you. Rather, I am saying that these are some of the meanings I see in the experiences that my clients and I have shared. Perhaps this picture of the experience of others may illuminate or give more meaning to some of your own experience. I have pointed out that each individual appears to be asking a double question. Who am I? And how may I become myself? I have stated that in a favorable psychological climate, a process of becoming takes place that here the individual drops one after another of the defensive mask with which he has faced life, that he experiences fully the hidden aspects of himself, that he discovers in these experiences the stranger who has been living behind these masks, the stranger who is himself. I have tried to give my picture of the characteristic attributes of the person who emerges, a person who is more open to all of the elements of his organic experience, a person who is developing a trust in his own organism as an instrument of sensitive living, a person who accepts the locus of evaluation as residing within himself, a person who is learning to live in his life as a participant in a fluid, ongoing process in which he is continually discovering new aspects of himself in the flow of his experience. These are some of the elements which seem to me to be involved in becoming a person. 